three hours passed and her body began to show the effects of death, the mother pleaded with the father to bless her, but he insisted that he still felt restrained. Finally, the impression came that he should now proceed. I returned to his words. All present in the home at that moment were people with faith in priesthood blessings. The feeling of what I should do and say was so strong within me that I knew Tisina would recover completely after the blessing. All right, brothers and sisters, welcome back to the program, The Last Dispensation. You're living in it. I am your host, Troy. Let's get into this. Raising the dead. We got a couple stories about that. Uh, most of the stories about being blind or being not alive and then being alive again. And they're miracles and they happen and they're given by apostles and prophets in these days. Let's read it together. Six faith promoting first hand accounts of Latter day miracles. That's right, brothers and sisters. This blog is called My Life by GoGoGoff.com. Yippee skippy, but they're great. Here we go. Let's get into it. I love miracles and not just the miracles of hundreds of years ago, but I love Latter day Saint miracles. I have heard countless third and second hand stories of miracles, but one always questions the details and accuracy. And if they are being embellished, of course, we all think about that, right? Are these embellishments? Is this real? Is this something President Oaks thinks may, might happen, but it really didn't? You know, to avoid these spiritual Twinkies, spiritual Twinkies, I've been seeking out accounts of firsthand miracles experienced by Latter day Saints. Mm, Twinkies. These Latter-day miracles defy science, facts, and logic, stories that show God and his priesthood. <clears throat> I need to speak more into this. And his priesthood command the elements, can heal, and even raise the dead are truly inspiring and powerful. And these are powerful stories, brothers and sisters. I just got through reading them because I just recorded this, and then it was on Echo, and I'm doing it again. That's why I'm kind of insane right now. I want, But I have the spirit. Don't worry. I want to share with you six faith-promoting first-hand accounts that I have found of Latter-day Miracles in the words of the people who performed, witnessed, or participated in them. Raising the Dead by Elder Matthew Cowley. Yes, this is the Matthew Cowley. This recording was in 1953. He was speaking at BYU. Uh, I believe President Oaks was there. And it's amazing. There's two accounts of his in this uh, article. Matthew Cowley, this one's about him raising... Uh, a man from uh, from the dead. Matthew Kelly served three missions in New Zealand, once as an elder, once as a mission president, and once as an apostle overseeing missions in the Pacific. In his time with the peoples of the Pacific, he performed, witnessed, and recorded many miracles. He shared many of these firsthand accounts. At an, at, at, at an address at BYU on the 18th of February, 1953, today I want to share two of them the first is his account of raising the dead. I was called to a home in a little village in, in New Zealand one day. There, the Relief Society sisters were preparing the body of one of our saints. They had placed his body in front of the big house, as they call it, uh, the house where the people come to wail and weep and mourn over the dead. When in, when in rushed the dead man's brother, he said, administer to him. And the young man, uh, Maoris, or I, I believe that's how you pronounce it, Ma Ma Maoris, Maoris said, why, you shouldn't do that. You do it. This same old man that I had with me when, he, when his niece was so ill was there. The dead man's brother got down on his knees and he anointed this man. Then this great old sage got down and blessed him and commanded him to rise. You should have seen the Relief Society sisters scatter. <laughs> Matthew Kelly was funny. There was laughter all throughout this speech, this talk when he gave it. He sat up. The dead man sat up. Send for the elders. I, I don't feel very well. 
of course, all of that was just psychological effect on that dead man. Wonderful, isn't it? This psychological effect business. We told him he had just been administered to, and he said, oh, that was it? He said, I was, a de- I was dead. I could feel life coming back into me, just like a blanket unrolling. He outlived his brother uh, that came in and told us to administer it to him. That was from Gospel Classic Miracles, Insigned, October 2004, and also from the 1953 talk. Here's another one. I love this one. And this has happened to me a few times before, similarly to this. An unfailing tank of gas by President Reed Tatioka. President Reed Tatioka of the Japan Sendai Mission was serving when the 2011 earthquake and Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster happened. He wrote an article detailing miracles his missionaries experienced during this crisis. But he also detailed a miracle he experienced as follows. Following the earthquake, there was a run on gasoline. The fuel trucks that could maneuver over broken roads traveled very slowly, resulting in three-hour waits for gasoline, if any was available at all. But the Lord provided for us in miraculous ways. For example, while evacuating sisters and elders to safety in Niigata on the other side of the island, we realized we had driven 18 hours on a single tank. That's neat. I believe it. I believe all these. With a gas gauge that always registered full. As we neared Niigata, the gas gauge immediately dropped to empty. That's from He Would Deliver Us, Enzyme, February 2018. Read Tatioka. Oh, I love this one too. Raising the Dead to Life by Elder Lahoni, uh, Lohi, Lohani, Yohani. I don't know if that's an I or an L, and I was wondering if that was if that was an L. Why would it be lower? Let's just say Lohani, Wolf Graham. This miracle was related by Dallin H. Oaks, President Oaks, in a talk given at a church educational system fireside in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, on the seventh of May, two thousand. President Oaks' commentary and framing of the firsthand account of this miracle by quotes from Elder Wolf Graham were too good to share. President Oaks related the following. Another sacred experience is related in the book Hongan Saints. It happened while Elder Lohani Wolfgram and his wife were serving a mission in their native Tonga. I almost said native tongue, but it's native Tonga, which would probably be in their native tongue. So leave me alone. Presiding over a branch on an outlying island, their three year old daughter was accidentally run over by a loaded taxi. Now you may be sad, but there is a happy ending to the story. Four of the occupants of the taxi, because, okay, so there's the, there's a lifeless body here. Four of the occupants of the taxi sorrowfully carried her lifeless body to her parents. Her head was crushed. Her face was terribly disfigured. The sorrowing helpers offered to take the little girl's body to the hospital so the doctors could repair her severely damaged head and face for the funeral. I now quote the words of her father, Elder Wolf Graham. I told them I did not want them to take her, but that I would ask God what I should do and if it was possible to give her life back. Now I want to stop here for a second. I have always felt that these type of miracles are not when we want them necessarily. They are all specifically done. Everything that happened to this girl was to show the power of God, whether it needed to be uh, driven home to this man, his family, to the community, whatever. But miracles like these, I firmly believe, are not when we ask and then the Lord just goes, okay, I'll do that. Maybe sometimes, maybe what depends. But the Holy Ghost is there. This is because the Lord was ready to do this. He wanted, this was a, this was 
this was from the beginning, I believe, choreographed by our Heavenly Father. It was all to show that he is in control of all things. And when we are asking, it's because the Holy Ghost is impressing us to ask for those things that are righteous. The helpers took the little girl's body into the chapel. Elder Wolfgram continued, I asked them to hold her while I gave her a priesthood blessing. By then, the curious people of the village were flocking in to see our stricken little girl, daughter. As I was about to proceed with the administration, I felt tongue-tied. Struggling to speak, I got the distinct impression that I should not continue with the ordinance. It was as if a voice were speaking to me saying, This is not the right time, for the place is full of mockers and unbelievers. Wait for a more private moment. My speech returned at that moment, and I addressed the group. The Lord has restrained me from blessing this little girl, because there are unbelievers among you, and, and, and who doubt, and you who doubt the sacred ordinance. Please help me by leaving so I can bless my child. The people left without taking offense. The grieving parents carried the little girl to their home put her body on her own bed, and covered her with a sheet. Three hours passed, and her body began to show the effects of death. The mother pleaded with the father to bless her, but he insisted that he still felt restrained. Finally, the impression came that he should now proceed. I returned to his words. All present in the home at that moment were people with faith in priesthood blessings. The feeling of what I should do and say was so strong within me that I knew Tisina would recover completely after the blessing. Thus, I anointed her head and blessed her in the name of Jesus Christ to be well and normal. I blessed her head and all of her wounds to heal perfectly thanking God for his goodness to me and allowing me to hold his priesthood and bring life back to my daughter. I asked him to open the doors of paradise so I could tell her to come back and receive her body again and live. The Lord then spoke to my heart and said, She will return to you tomorrow. You will be reunited with her once again the parents spent an anxious night beside the body of the little girl who appeared to be lifeless then suddenly the little girl awoke alive and well her father's account concludes i grabbed her i examined her her head i examined her face they were perfectly normal. All her wounds were healed. And from that day to this, she has experienced no complications from the accident. Her life was the miraculous gift from Heavenly Father during our missionary labors in Foe. That's Tongue and Saints. That's also in Tongue and Saints, page 88 through 89, and in Miracles, Enzyme, June. 2001, President Dallin H. Oaks. Here's another one by Matthew Cowley, Healing the Blind, the second miracle shared by Elder Matthew Cowley, and from the same talk he gave in 1953. And this is funny. This is funny. This is, it's cute. Cute. I said, All right, what's the name? So he told me the name, and I was just going to start when he said, By the way, Give him his vision when you give him his name. He was born blind. It shocked me. But then I said to myself, why not? I had faith in that father's faith. After I gave that child his name, I finally got around to giving him his vision. That boy is about 12 years old now. <laughs> the last time I was back there, I was afraid to inquire about him. 
I was sure he had gone blind again. Come on, Elder Cowley, that's not faithful. That's faithless. That's the way my faith works sometimes. And he admits it, right? So I asked the branch president about him and he said, Brother Cowley, the worst thing you ever did was to bless that child to receive his vision. He's the meanest kid in this neighborhood, always getting into mischief. Boy, I was thrilled about the kid getting into mischief. That's Gospel Classics, Miracles, Enzyme, October 2004, Elder Matthew Cowley. The Healing of a Blind Woman by President Gordon B. Hinckley. I, 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 lo- I, love, the- I love all these. And I like at the end what President Hinckley says to the woman who thanks him, him, for healing her. President Gordon B. Hinckley worked tirelessly to build a temple in Hong Kong, China. And he did. And he came to our temple, our Fresno temple here. I remember in 2000, I sang in the choir. And one of the things he said about uh, Fresno was, I don't know how you people can live in this desolate valley. And he's right. He relates one of the many miracles he experienced in Hong Kong as follows. I recall once when I arrived in Hong Kong, I was asked if I would visit a woman in the hospital whose doctors had told her she was going blind and would would lose her sight within a week. She asked if we would administer to her, and we did so. And she states that she was miraculously healed. I have a painting in my home that she gave me, which says on the back of it, to Gordon B. Hinckley, in grateful appreciation for the miracle of saving my sight. I said to her, I did not save your sight. Of course. The Lord saved your sight. Of course, of course, the Lord saved your sight. Thank Him and be grateful to Him. Now, it's interesting because he says that they went in to administer to her, but obviously he wasn't there long enough to see the results. A lot of the time, the Lord's, the Lord's hand um, is in it for a, a lengthy period of time in, in the, the after part of the the healing process and sometimes it's not an instant miracle that's i guess that's what i'm trying to say that's uh teachings of gordon b hinckley 1997 page 343 the blinding of enemies by alice w Blade, one of my favorites and these kind of miracles brothers and sisters you could go okay well maybe you know well you Maybe the soldiers passed her house up. Well, just check it out. It's neat. The Blinding of Enemies by Alice W. Flade. Alice W. Flade was born and grew up in eastern Germany. Near the end of World War II, Soviet forces ransacked their entire town in Kreis, Annenberg, Saxony, Germany. She related the following miracle of blindness and how their family was spared. At the end of World War II, When I was 19 years old, enemy troops came to occupy my hometown in Europe. One evening, my parents and I were sitting at our table when we heard a loud noise. We looked out through the blackout curtains, hung so that bombers couldn't detect our house at night to see enemy troops. Along with their motorcycles, trucks, and tanks, Coming into our village from two different directions. I was very frightened. My father, Paul Martin Wagner, always a faithful man, said simply, Don't be scared. Don't be scared. In the face of what was just outside our house, that was an extraordinary statement. We all knew that the soldiers would likely invade the neighborhood to pillage people's homes. Father suggested that we kneel next to the couch and pray for Heavenly Father's protection. He prayed, Father in Heaven, please blind those soldiers. 
make our house invisible so they won't see it. After he prayed, my mother, Elizabeth Hilbert, Martha Elizabeth Hilbert, prayed. Then I prayed. Afterward, we returned to the table and cautiously looked out the window. We watched soldiers storm into every house on our street. Ours was the last one on the street. They approached our house, but then passed our front gate and went to the next street. We watched them enter every house that we could see from our window. After an invasion of about two hours, someone blew a loud whistle and the soldiers returned to their vehicles. As they slowly left, we were tremendously relieved and knelt again, thanking Heavenly Father for His kindness and protection. The next day I learned from a... This is where I feel the saints... How are the saints... The saints won't escape persecution, but some of them will. I believe it's not a collective thing. It's an individual thing. And how is it? By your faith, by your prayers, by your worthiness, supplication, by keeping the commandments, by paying tithing, by going to the temple, by being an all-around Latter-day Saint that is good and is trying to do what is right. But not everyone that is even doing what is right will escape persecution either. But it is an individual case, and it is cases like this, where a family decides to all pray together. You have a righteous father. God bless righteous fathers. I'm not saying God, don't God bless righteous mothers. I love righteous mothers, but, but doggone it, fathers haven't heard it for a long time. God bless a righteous priesthood holder in the home. And this is how the saints escape persecution individually the next day i learned from a distraught friend that, that the soldiers had done terrible things in every house she knew of when i told her that they had not come to our house she was shocked she said she had watched them go in our direction and that she knew of no homes in our sector that they had not entered our house was the only one the soldiers had left alone I know that Heavenly Father hears our pleas and answers them. Sometimes it seems that we might not ever receive an answer, and we wish that He would answer sooner, and we wish that He would answer sooner. But I know that in our home, 65 years ago, He answered right away. Make our house invisible in Zion, August 2011. Alice W. Flade. Utah. Now, there was a conclusion here in the article, but I want to read you my own conclusion. In the spirit of sharing faith affirming experiences within our community with other saints, with other believers, not just other Christians, but other believers, like the beginning of the article said, uh, the blogger even states, that she gets excited about miracles, but not just any miracle. She says Latter-day Saint miracles. And I agree. If you're brothers and sisters, if you have Latter-day Saint guilt, pray about that. Don't be afraid to claim that you are a believer in the truth. Stop being ashamed of saying this is the only true church because it is. We used to say it and we were proud of it. And we just attracted those people who wanted the true church. It's important to recognize the role that miracles play in bolstering the faith of believers in our faith. Our church teaches the church of Jesus Christ that miracles are a divine manifestation of God's power and are not solely relegated to the past. They are seen as a means to comfort. They are seen as a means to strengthen. And they are there to strengthen the believer in miracles and not 
to convince the non-believers. I know these experiences are deeply personal and some of you are like, you shouldn't share these things. Don't cast your pearls before swine. I get that. They can be subject to mockery, but they're also subject to individual interpretation. And sometimes it makes it hard to mock something that others would just snub their nose at, walk away and go, "Mm, you know what? I'm not even bothering with that. Though people that fill the Holy Ghost, they stay and they bother themselves with it. Faith is a principle of action. It is a principle of power. And it grows from our obedience, brothers and sisters, to the Lord's commandments. And it grows stronger and stronger by the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. When we pay attention to those whisperings, when we know when we're worthy and the Spirit is telling us to give a blessing to our daughter, to raise her from the dead, that is not coming from us. That girl that was hit by the car, that happened for a reason. I don't believe that was an accident. Now, you can differ with that opinion, and I would like you to talk about it in the comments section. Let me know. Is there more pragmatism there? Does Heavenly Father maybe allow more agency in that area, and then he intervenes? Or does he choreograph something so divine and so beautiful that it's there specifically to demonstrate that he lives?